Uh, good morning. Welcome to CSIS. Uh, my name is Matthew Goodman. I am senior advisor for Asian Economics, and I hold the William E. Simon Chair in Political Economy here at CSIS. I'm delighted to have you with us uh, this morning. Thank you all for coming. Uh, welcome also to our online viewers. We have a loyal following around the world, and hello to friends who I know are watching in Beijing, uh, Connecticut, Toronto, uh, and other exotic places, and uh, we um, are delighted to have you uh, watching us. You can all uh, follow us on Twitter uh, at CSAS Live. Um, <laughs> before we begin, let me make a few administrative announcements. Uh, first, in case of fire or emergency, uh, you can head back down those main stairs and out in the lobby out to uh, Rhode Island Avenue, or you can also go through these doors uh, behind me, and there's a staircase on this side that goes down to the alley over there. So uh, please um, follow my team if uh, such a thing, in the unlikely event that such a, an emergency occurs. Um, restrooms are down the hall to uh, my right, your left, over here. Uh, coffee is available on the Sam Nunn Terrace behind you uh, throughout the morning, um, and we'll take a short break around 11.15 uh, if you want to fill up then. Uh, lunch will be served after the program if you'd like to stick around for that. We have a nice lunch uh, ready for you. Uh, and finally, please set your uh, phasers and other electronic devices on stun. Uh, with that, let's get started. So today, the Simon Chair is releasing a new report uh, examining China's economic decision making. Uh, you should have received the executive summary uh, of the report uh, when you entered, um, and you can access the full 107 page version online via our website, csas.org. It should be posted now. Um, we're very grateful to the Smith Richardson Foundation, Alcoa Foundation, the Japan External Trade Relations Organization, JETRO, uh, and the GE Foundation for their generous support of our study. Uh, we would also like to thank the many eminent scholars, officials, uh, and many other experts, both in China and in the United States, who offered us invaluable insights throughout our two-year study. Some of these people are acknowledged in the report, uh, but countless others deserve credit for helping us get to this point, so thank you. Finally, let me also acknowledge my team, uh, who have worked so hard on this project over the last two years. Uh, my deputy, Amy Studdard, I don't know where she is, but uh, somewhere here, there she is. Um, uh, our program manager, Grace Hardy, who I think is working as we speak, so isn't in here, but I think you all met Grace. Uh, and especially our research associate, oh, there she is, uh, David Parker, who did first-rate work researching a challenging topic and drafting most of the final report. So thank you, David. Uh, this report is the final product of a study we began shortly after China's current leadership moved into office in March 2013. As those of you who attended our midterm event one year ago with former Treasury Hank, uh, Secretary Hank Paulson may remember, we had set out to explore the institutions and processes of Chinese economic policymaking at a time when China was facing a challenging transition from a, ra from a rapid investment uh, an export-led growth model to a more modest but sustainable consumption-led growth model. Our goal was to map the key institutions and processes of economic decision-making in China, their enduring characteristics, and how they have changed under, under current president and Communist Party leader Xi Jinping, and to try to answer a, a central question. In a, in a more pluralized political economy in China, with multiple policy objectives and with numerous actors vying for policy space, do China's decision makers have the right stuff to navigate China's economy towards sustainable, balanced growth? The answer to this question has enormous significance for the United States. Whether Beijing succeeds or fails in its efforts, China's economic trajectory in coming years will have a substantial impact on the prospects for U.S. growth as well as on broader American interests in the Asia-Pacific region and beyond. Accordingly, we end the study with some recommendations for U.S. policymakers. So to cut to the punchline, our answer to the question of whether China's current leadership will be able to navigate a challenging economic transition is a qualified yes. Chinese economic policymakers have long demonstrated a remarkable pragmatism and flexibility in rising to various challenges and delivering on growth, 
and they still have a number of tools, a combination of, in, of incentives, controls, and resources at their disposal. Moreover, we think the actions Xi Jinping has taken over the past two years, including laying out a comprehensive reform agenda, restructuring the policymaking apparatus, and driving forward an intensive anti-corruption campaign, have on balance improved the odds of a successful transition. However, there are some Trans, there are some tensions and contradictions in Xi's approach, and the challenges today are qualitatively and quantitatively greater than any China has experienced since the reform and open, opening period began 35 years ago. Moreover, the clear weakening trend of China's economic data in recent months and the growing risks in the economy, not least those posed by China's rapid buildup of debt in recent years, have frankly lowered our confidence in our assessment uh, even since we finished the report. But on balance, we still see the odds uh, in Beijing's favor. I'll elaborate on this in a moment and we'll certainly debate it uh, in our upcoming expert panel. Uh, but first, let me provide some context on where China's economy is today. The story of China's economic miracle over the past three plus decades is well known to this audience, but it's worth repeating a few of the more uh, striking statistics. Since Deng Xiaoping launched the reform and opening strategy in 1979, China's economy has expanded more than 25 times in real terms. According to the World Bank, over that period, more than 600 million Chinese have been lifted out of poverty. Starting from a state of near autarky, China has become the world's largest trading nation, its largest exporter, its second largest importer, the second largest destination for foreign direct investment, and the third largest source of outbound investment. Within a decade, the OECD predicts that China will be the largest economy in the world at current exchange rates. In purchasing parity terms, this has probably already occurred. Yet after more than 30 years of spectacular growth, it is universally agreed that China has hit a wall. The country's old model of export, investment, and industry-led growth has clearly run its course, and China now appears stuck in the so-called middle-income trap. The current leadership under Xi Jinping recognizes this problem, which is more than you can say about many governments, uh, and has acknowledged that future growth will need to come from rebalancing of the economy toward a new model of consumption, services, and innovation-led growth. This was the backdrop to the sweeping reform agenda presented by the 18th Communist Party Central Committee at its third plenum in November 2013 and personally endorsed by Xi Jinping. The goal of the 300-plus measure plan was to give markets a so-called decisive role in resource allocation and to turn China into a moderately prosperous society by 2020. Yet this transition will inevitably involve what Beijing calls a new normal of slower growth, far below the double-digit rates of the past 30 years. Uh, last year, Dan Rosen, a senior associate here with the Simon Chair, and his colleagues at Rhodium Group estimated that even in a best-case scenario where Beijing achieves major progress on implementing the third plenum reform agenda, China's potential growth rate will fall to 6%. On the other hand, if Xi Jinping does not make significant progress on implementing his reform agenda, Dan and his colleagues estimate China's growth could fall below 1% within the same time frame. And of course, China's challenges are not only economic. Beijing is also dealing with a host of social, environmental, and governance issues. Thus, the demands on economic policy have burgeoned from a single-minded focus on growth to a multitude of goals, including clean air, clean government, and greater equality. Moreover, China's political economy has become increasingly pluralized over the last decade. The range of actors competing to influence economic policy, from state-owned enterprises to environmental activists, has expanded enormously. All of this has made policymaking far more challenging than it was under Deng Xiaoping. Facing these challenges is a Chinese policymaking apparatus that reflects as much the legacy of Mao Zedong as that of Deng Xiaoping, one based on a Leninist party state with a top-down hierarchical structure and prone to secrecy and poor internal coordination. The party exerts a strong pressure 
toward the centralization of policymaking. But at the same time, China's sheer size and the diversity of local interests exert an opposing force in favor of greater decentralization. The most durable description of China's policymaking system, developed in the 1980s by Ken Lieberthal and the late Michael Oxenberg, is one of fragmented authoritarianism. We're thrilled to have Ken with us today, um, and he'll be up here shortly. Drawing heavily on Ken and Mike's seminal work for our own research, we zeroed in on four enduring characteristics of Chinese economic decision making, which are described in the report. The first is persistent coordination challenges. Despite outside impressions of China's policymaking apparatus as monolithic, bureaucratic competition and poor coordination are endemic. This is enabled by a number of factors, not least the sheer number of ministry-ranked agencies and the fact that equal-ranked officials or agencies cannot issue binding orders to one another, creating a natural tendency toward gridlock. The second is the importance of central local relations. China is a massive country. Despite the unitary nature of the Chinese state, Beijing cannot simply disregard provincial interests and indeed has had to establish an elaborate system of incentives centered around advancement in the Communist Party to ensure policy implementation at the local level. The third characteristic is use of experimentation. A key feature of China's policymaking pioneered under Deng Xiaoping is localized policy exper experiments, some top-down, some bottom-up. Experimentation creates competition to determine which reforms will go nationwide and limits the political and economic risks should an initiative go awry. This suits Beijing's long-standing preference for incremental rather than decisive reforms, known in China as crossing the river by feeling the stones. Fourth is the reliance on external pressure as a tool of reform. This was the tactic former Premier Zhu Rongji relied on heavily in the 1990s, using China's WTO accession process to push an aggressive campaign to downsize the state sector and restructure China's insolvent banking sector. Echoes of this can be seen today in Beijing's growing interest in a bilateral investment treaty with the United States and even in the Trans-Pacific Partnership. While these four characteristics have in many ways persisted under the Xi Jinping administration, in his first two years in office, Xi has also put his own distinctive stamp on policymaking. The most obvious and important shift has been Xi's centralization of, the economic, of economic decision making and the particular way he has gone about this. Xi has consolidated control over the key levers of power more decisively than any leader in decades. Compared with his immediate predecessors, she has adopted a more rigid, I'm sorry, a more rapid, opaque, and personalized style of economic decision making and relied more on Communist Party rather than state mechanisms. He has used party bodies to sidestep China's official state apparatus and in effect to create a counter bureaucracy for coordinating his reform agenda. The so called comprehensively deepening reform leading small group, which is quite a mouthful, uh, but an important body established following the third plenum, has now become the command center for China's economic reform program. We elaborate on Xi's policy making changes in our report. For today's purposes, I want to focus on what Xi's style and approach say about the prospects for reform and a successful economic transition. On the plus side, Xi's personal decision making style and heavy use of party institutions have allowed him to sidestep bureaucratic gridlock empower a trusted and talented team of technocrats, and assert greater direct control over the economic policymaking process. The breadth of the third plenum reforms illustrates that she and his advisors understand the interrelatedness between seemingly disparate policy issues. In this, and in his use of external pressure to help organize and push his agenda, she is also clearly borrowing from the playbook used in earlier successful reform drives such as the one orchestrated by former Premier Zhu Rongji in the 1990s. Finally, there is a serious case to be made that despite the rather limited visible progress on economic reform to date, she is deliberately taking a sequenced approach that begins with an overhaul of China's governance system and a move to rule of law, or rule by law. His vigorous anti-corruption campaign can be seen in this light as an effort to lay the foundations for reform. 
In other ways, however, Xi's approach entails significant risks that could undermine China's transition toward a modern, harmonious, and creative high-income society, which is the uh, statement of the goal. Empowering the Communist Party at the expense of the state runs counter to earlier reform drives, including that overseen by Ju, and reinforces a tendency towards secrecy, unpredictability, and heavy-handed controls that sit uncomfortably alongside Beijing's stated goal of transitioning toward a more market-based economic and financial system. Previous leadership's emphasis on consensus-based decision-making was an impediment to rapid change, but also an effective tool for gaining buy-in from the bureauc bureaucracy and troubleshooting proposed policy measures. Xi's approach may be generating other unintended consequences. Importantly, in the context of our study, the anti-corruption campaign appears to have produced near paralysis in local decision-making, which is key to implementation of reform, and this is likely to have dampened growth in the short term. Moreover, Xi's efforts to purge so-called Western values and measures aimed at indigenizing China's information technology infrastructure are not only making China's relations with trading partners more contentious, but could also have negative consequences for future innovation, productivity growth, and China's ability to generate unique intellectual property. In sum, there remains an unresolved tension, really the central tension of our study, between Xi's grasp for greater political control, on the one hand, and the imperative, on, and the imperative of letting go economically, on the other. But as we say in the report, this does not mean it's time to count China out. Successful generations of Chinese leaders have proven themselves pragmatic, flexible, and capable politicians, adapting well to changing circumstances over the course of China's decades-long economic miracle. Xi has demonstrated particular confidence in his approach, and on balance, we believe the new mechanisms of economic decision-making he has adopted will strengthen uh, his ability to implement the reforms needed to produce stable, sustainable growth. 2015 is likely to be an important year to test this conclusion. Roughly halfway into Xi's presumed first term, this year may be the last chance to make a major push for reform before the political wrangling ahead of the next party Congress in 2017. Uh, again, we're going to talk about all of this uh, more uh, in the expert panel, so, uh, so feel free to uh, build up your questions for that. Um, now let me talk about recommendations for the U.S. government. As I mentioned earlier, China's success or failure at managing its economic transition will have enormous consequences for the United States economically and in terms of American policy interests. Thus, in the final chapter of our report, we argue that policymakers in Washington should spend more time understanding economic decision-making and reform in China and shaping appropriate policies in response. We offer a dozen mostly procedural and organizational ideas for how to better engage with China on economic policy issues and how to organize the U.S. government to do so. You can see the full list in the summary report you have in front of you, but let me just highlight a few here. Our first pair of recommendations is that Washington support China's economic reforms where they align with U.S. interests and not be afraid to challenge Beijing when its policies are out of step with our interests. From an, from an American perspective, there is much to like about the third plenum reforms, from giving the market a decisive role in the Chinese economy to prioritizing financial reform. We should encourage these changes, citing the win-win benefits to China and the United States. At the same time, as our study shows, external pressure is an important tool of Chinese decision-making, and the U.S. should look for carrots and sticks to shape Chinese behavior in a way that advances U.S. interests, from pursuing initiatives like TPP to filing WTO dispute settlement cases where appropriate. In doing all this, we need to be smarter about the way we communicate our interests to China and the world, and I think you know what I'm going to say next. Um, so this, uh, and I'm offline here, but uh, this incident with the Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank um, has obviously been a, uh, a significant failure of U.S. public diplomacy. Um, I actually think it's also a failure of economic statecraft because we did not think through uh, what the implications of this new institution were and uh, 
come up with a smart strategy. There were some legitimate questions from a U.S. perspective about this bank. There still are about governance and um, uh, lending standards and so forth. Uh, but uh, the right way to have done that was to have gotten a group together and decided on a, a, a comprehensive strategy for uh, asking those questions uh, to the Chinese directly and through our allies and, and partners uh, rather than uh, through uh, a distinguished pink newspaper. Um, so uh, so I, I think that this is a case study in why the U.S. needs to do economic statecraft better and bring the economic and foreign policy worlds together. And this is a major theme of what the Simon Chair works on, not just in China, but on other issues. Um, uh, inc incidentally, uh, one of the, our other recommendations, number four in the list, is uh, that the U.S. and China should establish, that the White House in Zhongnanhai, effectively China's White House, should uh, establish a, an informal back channel to discuss issues like this. This has been noted by observers on both sides um, widely is something that's missing in the relationship right now. And uh, we uh, believe strongly that such a, such a channel is, is very important. It's existed in the past and it, it should be a matter of course in U.S.-China relations today. Um, okay, back on the script. Uh, among our recommendations for organizing the U.S. government, we propose that the White House convene an interagency process to develop a comprehensive written strategy on China ideally codified in a national security presidential directive or the like. Uh, the process alone would be useful in underscoring the priority that the White House places on China policy and ensuring that all agencies are aligned on strategy and messaging. Writing the strategy down would be even better to help ensure consi consistency of approach across agencies and across time. As far as we know, no such presidential strategy document on China has ever been produced. Finally, let me highlight one more recommendation, number eight in the report, namely that Washington engage fully in institution building and norm setting in the Asia Pacific region and globally, working with our allies and partners and directly with China. This means being active in bodies like APEC, I'm not gonna spell it out for this crowd, um, pursuing and completing regional economic integration initiatives like TPP and continuing to seek cooperation from China in the G20, which incidentally Beijing will be hosting in 2016. It also means following through on commitments to reform of existing institutions of global economic governance like the IMF and engaging constructively with China on establishment of new institutions, as I said, like the AIIB. The goal of all these efforts is to incentivize China to work constructively within the existing rules-based order by demonstrating that the order basically works for China and has worked for China, certainly for those 600 million uh, Chinese. Let me end with a point uh, we make at the start of the recommendations chapter, which is that Washington needs a new mindset in dealing with the China of 2015 and beyond. This is not the China of a decade ago, nor is it just another country with which China, the United States has a few opportunities to be seized and, and tensions to be managed. After 30 plus years of rapid growth, China has resumed its historical place as the largest economy in Asia, and Beijing has made clear that it intends to play a greater role in the regional and global order. The U.S. needs to respond to this changing reality in a way that acknowledges China's return to prominence, but also advances and protects U.S. interests. Thus, we argue that senior U.S. policymakers need to devote far more time, resources, and policy bandwidth to China than they have to date and to do so in a smarter way. The starting point is to understand what's going on inside China, which is what we hope our report has made a small contribution to doing. So with that, I will stop talking and invite our distinguished uh, panel of experts up on stage to help shed more uh, light on all these issues. Thank you. Come on up, guys. Backwards. Sorry, you're there, Scott. Hey, Hafan. Hafan, you're over there. Okay. Thanks.
lot of words. Uh, okay. All right. Okay. So, um, well, I am uh, really honored, and now you get the real money here, uh, not just me, but you get the real pros um, up on stage. So uh, I'm delighted to be joined by this uh, fantastic panel of experts here. Um, I think um, uh, some of them, at least, are, are very well known to a Washington audience, some maybe not so much, so, uh, but they're all, uh, they're all uh, real professionals and real experts in, in, uh, in their respective fields. And, uh, bring a lot of light to shine on, on these uh, issues that we've been looking at in our report. So to my immediate right is Ken Lieberthal, who I know you all know, Senior Fellow for Foreign Policy Studies at the Brookings Institution, and as I mentioned before, really the, the man who wrote the book from our point of view, literally, um, on this topic back in the 1980s and has written on this subject many times since. To his right is Hufan, who is uh, Dr. Hufan, who is Senior Re Research Fellow from the Institute of, International, of World Economics and Politics at the Chinese Academy of Social Sciences and Senior Economics Fellow at the Institute uh, for New Economic Thinking in New York. Uh, to my immediate left is Charlene Chu, who is partner in charge of China Banks uh, at Autonomous Research in New York. Uh, there's more bio biographical information in your packets, so I'm not going to go through all of it here. Um, uh, and to her left, uh, your right is Scott Kennedy, my colleague, Deputy Director of the Freeman Chair in China Studies uh, and Director on the Project on China Business and Political Economy here at CSAS. Uh, and I've already introduced myself, right? Matt Goodman. Um, so uh, let me uh, start. We're going we're gonna to talk for about uh, 30 minutes, and then I'm going to open up the floor to, uh, to your questions and, and uh, real discussion, I hope. So please uh, uh, prepare those questions. Um, let me start on the kind of economics, and, and then we'll get to the policy and the, the, uh, the policy making. But let me start with Hufan and ask, what's going on in China? How, how uh, it's clear that growth is slowing down. Mm -hmm. um, is this uh, something that is, you know, a natural part of the transition process, the adjustment process? Is there something uh, more going on? And, and what do you think is the outlook uh, for the sort of near to medium term? Okay. Um, thanks, Matthew, for inviting me, and I learned quite a lot from your very important and insightful report. Um, yes, it is true. I think uh, the main challenge that China is facing now is uh, the downside risk for economic growth. And this is inevitable, because mainly because of the change of the fundamentals. One is uh, we are losing the population dividend because of the rapid change of demographic profile. And second, because we are moving more close to the frontier of technology. So that make that more difficult for, for uh, China, Chinese economy to catch up. Um, and also the policymaker in China, I think they are uh, having a very difficult time because uh, this kind of a trilemma, uh, which means uh, uh, Chinese policymaker has three most important goals, but whichever goal you choose, it may have conflict with the other two. So the first important goal is uh, economic growth. But then in order to maintain the high growth, the most convenient way is you adopt the traditional growth model, which rely heavily on investment, especially government investment on infrastructure and heavy industry. But that will not create enough job because those are capital intensive sectors. And then, because of the uh, expansionary fiscal policy and the monetary policy after the global financial crisis, it created overcapacity and non-performing loans in the banking system and local government debt, all the problems. So we know we cannot do that. And if we want to create a more job opportunity, the most important thing is to open up the service sector. But then, because the uh, service sector in general, especially the, the traditional service sector, um, the uh, increase of productivity in service sector cannot catch up with that in the manufacturing sector. So a natural result is with this structural reform, with a higher share of service sector in China's economy, and the result will be the potential growth rate in China will fall continually. And uh, um, at the same time, I don't think China's financial system has well prepared for this uh, sea change in the Chinese economic structure. They have uh, experienced um, 
uh, dealing with the manufacturing sectors when um, in the past and that's the, their main clients for the commercial banks. So if there's all kinds of new startups in the service sector, I doubt whether they can uh, very successfully distinguish which is a good investment opportunity, which is not. And the financial stability, the main concern is after the uh, global financial crisis and with this, uh, this very expansionary monetary policy. And now um, we have to force the, uh, the corporate sector to have a deleveraging. So they have to keep tight monetary policy. But then if you tighten your monetary policy uh, too much, and then that you may have a, a hard landing uh, uh, risk for the Chinese economy. So it's really very difficult to balance. Um, but um, uh, recently there's a buzzword in China. Uh, people are talking about the resilience of Chinese economy. Uh, and I do believe that we have um, reasons, good reasons to believe that China still have uh, uh, potentials. Uh, you know, in the last uh, um, two decades, uh, there was dramatic change uh, of macroeconomic policy in China. In Zhu Rongji's period, Zhu Rongji stepped on the brake. And in Wen Jiabao's period, Wen Jiabao stepped on gas. And now in Li Keqiang's period, Li Keqiang stepped on the gas and the brake at the same time. But still, China, uh, it, Chinese economy is, um, um, to a great extent, uh, functioning well. And what we need to do is we need to accelerate this structural reform to unleash the great potential <coughs> of the Chinese economy. So I'm not worried too much about the uh, uh, decline of the GDP growth rate per se. Uh, which is more important <coughs> is how we can maintain a relatively high but sustainable growth rate in the long run, say 10 years or 20 years. And then we have a very good chance to grow out all the problems. You don't think there's any magic number that China has to grow in order to preserve jobs or, their, or stability, which? Uh, there's one um, you know, all often um, uh, heavily discussed issue in China, whether China can overcome this middle income trap. And if you take this as the goal for Chinese government, and then you want to, um, you know, uh, from the current uh, uh, per capita level, and then you can um, uh, join the high income uh, country club, which means um, 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 probably in the coming one or two decades, we should maintain a growth rate above 5%. Well, that's, um, I think that's uh, uh, achievable for China. In the last uh, uh, um, 50 years, the average growth rate in China is something around 5.5%. Yeah. Okay, all right, uh, thank you. Well, I have some follow-up questions, but let me uh, turn to Charlene, because you have spent many years, uh, both in your current job and previously at a ratings agency, looking in detail at the balance sheets of Chinese banks and uh, their other activities. Um, I'm almost afraid to ask this question because of the possible answer we may get here and people may run for the exits, but uh, how, how, how worried should we be about um, the debt problems in China, which um, have clearly expanded quite rapidly, uh, but nobody seems to have a quite, handle, quite a handle on how big the problem is and uh, whether the Chinese government you know, has a good handle on it or not. But talk about the problem and, and what it means for growth. Okay. Um, I I think you know, the bottom line to whether or not we should be worried is absolutely. Um, I do find that people in DC are less familiar with some of the economic data, so probably the numbers that encapsulate this the most are the fact that banking sector assets in China grew from 9 trillion US dollars at the end of 2008 to 28 trillion US dollars at the end of last year. That's a rate of growth that the world has never seen. The entire size of the US banking sector is about $15 trillion. So China replicated the US banking system in less than six years and added another two to three on top of that. We are still growing at a pace where we're adding two and a half to three trillion US dollars in assets every year. And this is happening at the same time that economic growth is slowing. 
So the reason why I'm so concerned about this is we are in this dynamic where regardless of what you read in the headlines about shadow banking growth or deleveraging and this type of thing happening in China, the bottom line is credit growth is still twice as fast as GDP and you are not going to grow out of this problem and that dynamic. You cannot have something that is twice as big as something else. So credit to GDP is about 230% at the end of last year. You cannot have something that's twice as big as something else and growing twice as fast and expect to get out of that problem. Um, so there's no doubt that the authorities are doing a lot on the reform side, but what they've done is identify the problems and come up with solutions, and we actually haven't seen a whole lot of progress in terms of um, implementation. And I think on top of that, it's very important to keep in mind that they are trying to, and I know this paper was focused on financial liberalization, they are trying to undertake what is an incredibly complicated reform program in any context, in any country, in the middle of the biggest debt boom the world has ever seen. At a time when economic growth is slowing, and slowing economic growth means slowing profit growth for Chinese corporates, which means they have less and less ability to repay this stuff. And we've also got declining bank profits. So, um, you know, just I think ending on that note, um, the growth of credit, I said, is twice as fast as GDP. It's now three times as fast as bank profitability. Um, so you're also not going to be able to get the banks to earn their way out of this problem. Uh, thank you for mentioning that a major part of our report it does focus on financial reform. We, we decided to sort of dive in a little more deeply there to look at how these policy-making mechanisms work in finance because it's so critical to the overall <coughs> judgment about making this transition. <coughs> Um, and because, frankly, it's a little easier to get your handle on um, uh, this area of public policy because it's, you know, largely driven by a couple of institutions in Beijing. Um, so thank you for mentioning that. Um, it's, you can read that in the full report. Um, on, um, and, and I, I do um, think that this uh, question is um, really difficult in terms of uh, reform because it is so important to reform and yet the sequencing of, of changing uh, these policies in, in finance is, is critically important whether you you know raise interest whether you deregulate interest rates open the capital account uh, let the uh, the exchange rate uh, become more market determined all of these things if you do them in the wrong order uh, could create real uh, substantial risks and yet, you know, they so far seem to be managing a process of moving forward the agenda, and there have been some interesting developments in financial reform. Maybe you could talk about a couple of those before I turn to others about the f reform process. Um, well, and what do you think I, the I authorities think the are doing to grapple with this? Probably the one of the more significant ones in the announcement just came overnight, which was um, the implementation of deposit insurance. Um, and this is quite important. The authorities have said that this, in their view, is a precursor to full interest rate liberalization, and it does help address this very long-standing problem in China of moral hazard um, and the fact that everybody just thinks the government is going to bail everything out. And this, for the first time, puts some parameters around what they're willing to support in the banking sector. So I do think that is quite important. Um, the other area where they've been doing a lot, but I actually think the effects of this are incredibly negative and underappreciated, is deposit rate liberalization through um, this rapid growth of shadow credit. They're essentially allowing this parallel financial system to come online and they can offer um, yields and returns to investors that are above deposit rates and it's creating this huge competitive pressure on the banking system. And the last thing you need when you're in the middle of a big credit boom is a loss of funding. The last thing you want is a large migration of deposits out of the formal system into the informal system. Okay, well I wanna come back to that too, but let, let me um, turn to sort of the, the broader um, decision-making issues that we addressed in our report. And Ken, um, so we, noted, I don't think we were arguing, I think noted that China no longer is pursuing just one objective, which is growth and rising incomes, which seems to have been the organizing force um, for, uh, for the reform process for 30 years. 
and, and now there are multiple objectives that you know, they're trying to achieve, yet the system of incentivizing local officials to, uh, who have to do the implementation of reform was really built around this single metric that you could measure. Um, and so talk to us about how they're dealing with this change with multiple objectives, how they're changing the incentives to get the local level to respond in the way they want them to respond. Well, it's, it's a very, very difficult issue. Let, let's, keep, <clears throat> excuse me, let's keep in mind that China has 40,000, little almost 43,000 local political jurisdictions from the provincial level, 31 units, to the municipal level, over 700, uh, to the county level, nearly 2,500, to the township level, 40,000. Uh, and the system has worked all along uh, under the reforms on the basis of, of recognizing the importance of, of uh, get, allowing some uh, room for adaptation, flexibility and initiative within each of those localities, within each of those jurisdictions uh, in order to uh, move the economy forward, move it along broadly the directions that the top leadership articulates, uh, but with a lot of flexibility and a lot of power in the hands of the top political leadership within each locality. And as Matt mentioned, uh, they, they've given them an array of goals, but at the end of the day, <clears throat> the thing that has produced the, uh, the highest performance evaluations has been move, growing your GDP every year. And they're evaluated every year, and that has accounted for more of the evaluation than any other uh, single item or even group of items. Uh, now they're shifting. And they're shifting in, a, in an array of ways that are both critical for macroeconomic uh, sustainability, uh, but very difficult for most local leaders. Uh, difficult for leaders in part because they're moving from issues that were relatively measurable, GDP growth, to ones that are much less amenable to uh, accurate and easy measurement, especially on an annual basis. Uh, and so local, local officials are being told now to pursue qualitative changes and aren't quite sure what's going to be rewarded and how it will be measured. Uh, a lot of the things in the reform agenda don't line up neatly with each other. You know, increase urbanization, uh, reduce unemployment, uh, but don't pursue high GDP growth as a key goal. Uh, you know, there, there are a lot of things that just require adjustments uh, that make them uh, difficult to do together. Uh, and there's been very little guidance to this point as to what the priorities are and uh, how you will be evaluated on the basis of those priorities. This is also occurring at the same time that one thing that is relatively measurable is being pursued very, very dramatically, and that's the anti-corruption campaign, which creates disincentives to kind of stand out, make changes in localities by local leaders in ways that may uh, call attention to themselves and uh, get others uh, interested in pointing out past, past problems that those leaders have had in terms of sources of income and how they've gotten things done. Uh, so you've got a, a very complicated process here of, on the one hand, really strengthening the authority of the local party leaders who have been the key drivers of this, uh, but at the same time, uh, making it more difficult for them to know what to do, more difficult for the top leaders to know whether they're doing it because the key metrics are changing in directions that are harder to, that the system in the past has not focused on how you, how you quantify and how you collect data on, uh, and an anti-corruption campaign that really disincentivizes taking a great deal of initiative. Uh, and the internal party processes, as you mentioned in your summary of your report, are less visible uh, and uh, less subject to external uh, validation, external supervision, than are the government processes. So as the party assumes a stronger role, uh, this makes the whole thing a little bit murkier. So again, I kind of come out where Hafan does. These changes are very difficult. There's a lot of downside risk here. 
this is a system that has shown tremendous resiliency over time. But the changes that are now being uh, uh, pursued uh, are ones that are really uh, very, very, very challenging. And I don't think they have yet figured out how to evaluate local officials in a way that local officials know how to act and at higher levels know whether they're doing what they want those officials to do. Right. Uh, it's um, interesting. We were sort of kicking this around yesterday and, and um, thinking that, you know, to really address these multiple conflicting objectives, I mean, in our system, you would have a, an outlet for evaluating people through the, you know, through an election because, you know, if the mayor wasn't collecting your trash or doing all the things that the multiple things that, that are expected, then you can throw the bum out and get a, a new guy. You obviously can't do that in China and it doesn't look like that's in, in prospect that there's going to be that sort of outlet um, uh, that's meaningful for these matters in any yeah. time. In, the in fact, it's actually been moving in the opposite direction in the last couple of years under Xi Jinping. Uh, there had been increasing use of uh, NGOs, of civil society, uh, groupings of various sorts, of uh, uh, social media, even of, uh, you know, even of the, the uh, established media. Uh, to point out where policies were, weren't being implemented properly, where uh, different kinds of problems were arising. Uh, now we're seeing uh, a lot of risk attached to uh, criticizing uh, uh, what is happening in localities, even where the criticism is directly in line with the goals that the top leadership is, uh, wants to pursue. Essentially, what we see is a leadership that now really does not want the population to get out ahead uh, and to begin to drive the timing or focus of the agenda. They really want to do it in terms of what uh, Xi Jinping has called top-level design, uh, so that we maintain not only the shape of the overall program, but the pacing of it and prioritization of it, and don't let other sources of information come in and push us at a speed or with, with a shift in relative priorities that we don't want to grapple with. That makes it even more difficult uh, to get checks on what's happening because remember, this is just a vast system and most information goes up and most orders go down level by level through five levels with adjustments made at each level. Uh, and so to uh, reduce the external checks on this uh, has a price. Okay, lots of food for discussion there as well. Uh, but let me turn to Scott because you mentioned, Ken, uh, some of these other um, uh, stakeholders and participants in the policy making process. And let me ask about one that you've spent a lot of time working on, Scott, which is sort of interest groups and um, the corporate sector and how they have uh, come to uh, get more involved in policy making. What is their role and how are they helping or hindering uh, the reform process? Sure. Um, thanks, Matt. Uh, the short answer is, is that interest groups uh, can supplement an analysis on the uh, role of the elite leadership and the bureaucracy, central and local, uh, and partly explain uh, the extent of recent changes uh, to China's financial policies, which is the subject of your report. Uh, but the role of interest groups and what you assign to them depends on your belief and your judgment about how significant those reforms are. Let me just uh, elaborate a little bit. Uh, in general, about interest groups, um, you know, from the Communist Party's perspective, um, they represent everybody, and there aren't differences. There shouldn't be differences. Um, and they keep a, a very big tent in their view. Uh, that's why industry associations and chambers of commerce in China uh, are often state controlled. Um, there are some more independent associations in sectors where there are lots of private companies and foreign companies, but overall associations tend to be retirement homes for uh, cadres at the end of their career. Um, and some of these associations can only become powerful by uh, weaning away regulatory authority uh, from government institutions. Uh, China also relatedly has very weak laws related to conflict of interest. Um, now, the party now recognizes that there are actual differences and conflicts of interest uh, between different stakeholders in the country. 
Uh, but the way they describe it is in, in highly negative terms only uh, as entrenched interests. That's the, the key word that you hear talked about in China the last few years. That's what we would call special interests. Uh, state-owned enterprises in uh, protected sectors, central state agencies, local governments, uh, essentially opponents of reform, uh, folks who don't represent the supposed general interest. So interest groups aren't seen as positive, they're seen as negative factions uh, working against uh, the party. Um, and so even though Li Keqiang has called for, in his original plans, liberalizing industry associations, they've made zero progress on that, as Ken has pointed out, uh, in every sphere of dealing with uh, uh, the governance over society. Uh, so as a result of this uh, interest group conflict in China that does exist is hidden, it's opaque, um, it's, it's hard to track. Um, and it often doesn't occur via groups. It often just occurs individually, single company to single regulator. So in the financial sector, uh, there's obviously plenty of, of interest groups that one could point out. The, probably the most important are the large state-owned banks. Um, and you, but you could also look at the insurance companies and others who, who have benefited tremendously uh, from uh, the, the growth in credit. Um, there are a variety of associations in the financial sector, uh, from the China Banking Association to the National Association of Financial Market Institutional Investors and others. All of those associations are government controlled, and you should use the word association with quote marks around them for these organizations. Um, you have the regulators uh, that these associations come out of, uh, like the People's Bank of China, the China Banking Regulatory Commission, um, and uh, the party as well, the, the leading group on economics and finance and also the leading group on uh, deepening economic reform that you mentioned in your initial remarks. Uh, I think what's, what's it, two things that are interesting about this. One is the regulators of the financial sector are consistently more liberal than the industry they regulate. Um, uh, you meet some of the most liberal thinkers, people with world-class educations from around the world, uh, who clearly have identified the problems that China face in the uh, financial sector, in the state, and in the party. You're talking about like in the PBOC, in and the, the P regulatory yeah, commission? Yes, the, China, the People's Bank of China, also in these leading groups, the experts that work on those groups. They are very clear-headed about uh, what's going on and have come up with a lot of this proposed reform suggestions. But at the same time, you also have this revolving door uh, between uh, the regulators and the uh, financial institutions actually that you don't have in most of the rest of the economy. Um, there is, a, uh, at the lower level, a large revolving door of, of folks leaving the regula regulators going to work in, in banks and securities firms. At the higher level, uh, you, that occurs as well, and actually they go back and forth. Zhou Xiaochuan, the central bank governor, obviously he was originally the head of the China Construction Bank. Uh, and, and this is quite different than most sectors of the economy, where there is some amount of revolving door, uh, but not to the extent. Most, in most, state, most sectors, particularly where the state-owned uh, companies dominate, uh, the leadership of those firms rise up through the companies over the course of their career, and with some movement perhaps into government or the other direction, but not to the extent in, in the financial sector. So what have these interest groups done if they're powerful in, in finance? Well, if we just focus on banks, uh, banks have always been a, a strong advocate for a loose monetary policy, expanding the money supply. They've been strong advocates opposing interest rate liberalization because they benefit from the essentially guaranteed positive credit spread between loan and deposit rates. Uh, they've been long-term opponents of deposit insurance uh, and, of course, opponents of market entry of, of genuine private banks and foreign banks. And foreign banks in China have less than 2% of the business. Well, recently, as your report uh, describes and has already been mentioned, there have been some policy changes. Uh, policy now, as, as Hefan said, much tighter uh, monetary policy to some extent. Uh, there's been some liberalization of deposit rates recently with the widening of the band. Um, just yesterday, the announcement about deposit insurance that'll take effect beginning May 1st. Uh, and a gradual um, legalization of the gray market and potential approval of, of more private banks. So 
what accounts for these trends? I think, again, it depends on what your, what your, what you, how you view these uh, reforms. If you think these are token reforms that don't add up to much, that really don't get at the heart of the system, uh, then this looks like uh, business capture of the policy process. This interest group basically staving off reform. Uh, and it's interesting to note that although there's been a wide anti-corruption campaign, there's been almost no attention of that campaign on the financial sector. Uh, uh, a couple bank heads, uh, the, the head of uh, uh, China Minsheng Bank has been uh, investigated, but nowhere near as in other, other sectors. So that would show the power potentially of this uh, of these interest groups. On the other hand, if you think these policy changes matter a lot and they are significant and are leading China to have a more commercial-oriented banking sector, then an interest group explanation really doesn't explain why we have the change because you don't see that change coming. You can't imagine that private companies or foreign companies are, have been able to uh, you know, log roll uh, Xi Jinping. Uh, instead, you're gonna, the initiative, if these are significant, comes from Xi Jinping, the new sheriff in town, uh, his advisors that he has around him, uh, get, both in the government and the party, um, and then um, the way they've changed the bureaucracy to, to sideline those old parts of the bureaucracy. Um, in that regard, uh, they've been able to do it without an anti-corruption campaign, which would be surprising. But it, it's less surprising if you understand that even though these are potentially powerful interest groups, because of that revolving door, they are also representatives of the state as well. And so in that, in that regard, you get state capture of interest groups, the opposite conclusion that you'd have if you think that these are relatively insignificant reforms. Wow, okay, interesting. The state, you say they haven't gone after the financial sector. I thought they were starting to move, and it seems logical that they might, because they've been going after some of the other pillars of, of the state-owned sector, particularly in energy. Um, is, there, is there no sign they're going after finance? Because that would seem to me quite significant in terms of uh, well, what you said and in terms of uh, the, the, what it means for their, uh, their focus on, on reform more broadly. You would, you would think so, and, and Charlene could probably well, speak to this better, better well, but than me. Um, but you know, if, if there's corruption anywhere in the Chinese political economy, you would ought to find it in the financial sector. So that they haven't started on that uh, seems to me uh, a, a, a strange thing, uh, unless they figure what they're going to go after first are uh, SOEs in, in the manufacturing sectors like oil and, and other places where we've seen more of this in Shanxi, in the coal industry. Uh, and maybe they're going uh, step by step in the, and that we'll see this. I, I, I don't know. Uh, if these reforms are considered significant, then maybe you don't have to. Uh, also, maybe it's just too close to home uh, for, for some of these, these leaders, um, it seems, uh, and, and so maybe what they're doing is they're focusing on other parts of the system uh, instead of directly on the financial uh, sector, and by changing the broad incentives around that shape behavior with related, relation to interest rates, the money supply, deposit insurance, maybe that's the way they feel that they could squeeze the rents out of the banking system without actually having to take down individual officials. Do you have a view on that, on how they're viewing the, the, the state-owned banks in the context of um, you know, the anti-corruption drive and, and its relationship to? Uh, I mean, it's definitely a question everybody's been asking. Um, and I'll just tell you what one government official told me a few weeks ago, which is that nobody is immune, and this is not ending anytime soon. So um, I think they've got phases of this campaign. Um, the financial sector clearly has not been on the table yet, but it's not clear to me that it is not going to happen. Um, I do think at some point um, there is definitely a risk that the focus shifts to the financial sector. Um, and I think, you know, I think Hofan probably knows better than all of us here. Uh, the likelihood of that, but it could be quite destabilizing for this whole uh, debt issue that we're talking about. Because the last thing you want, um, I mean, as Ken was talking about, the corruption campaign has caused, has screwed up the incentives at the local level. We're starting to have people just not want to do anything. The last thing you want is that to happen in the financial sector, because the only reason this hasn't fallen apart yet is because they just keep rolling all of the debt. They keep extending new credit every year um, on the order of a couple trillion US dollars. So 
if you're going to start going after people and making them afraid, they're going to start getting worried about lending new money, continuing to roll over some of those sketchy exposures that they undertook a few years ago. Um, I don't know if that's part of the thinking now in terms of why they, they have been uh, hesitant. But um, I do agree with Scott, there's no way you have corruption at the level we do in the financial sector or in the country without financial sector participation. Um, fine, you've been very patient uh, waiting there and a lot has been said here. You, you can react to any of this, but uh, in particular the issue of, um, of whether, well, the financial sector and how, uh -huh. how serious you think that the concerns are in that se sector and whether this is something that um, is, it does pose a risk how much of a risk does it pose to growth? Uh, first uh, response to uh, uh, Scott, I don't think uh, commercial banks, um, even if it's state-owned commercial banks, can get any special protection in this anti-corruption campaign. You know, the head of the uh, Central Party uh, Discipline Inspection Department, Wang Qishan, you know all the tricks. He used to work in commercial banks and he, he uh, um, uh, so he's very familiar with that business. So uh, we'll wait and see. Um, and for commercial, uh, for uh, this financial system, um, it is true that uh, the non-performing loans is accumulating, and then the uh, local government debt, that's a very serious problem that we need to solve in the, uh, as quickly as possible. And also you can see the profitability of major uh, state-owned commercial banks has dropped dramatically in recent years. But um, financial crisis, in essence, is not insolvency, it's liquidity. So in that concern, uh, I think uh, for the time being, uh, the situation is still under control. Um, but the problem is um, China need to, you know, solve the problem of too big to fail because we have all those uh, very large state-owned commercial banks. And one way uh, that we can do in the Ch traditional Chinese way is uh, they call it to kill the chicken, to frighten the monkey. But then the trick is by killing how much chicken you can frighten the monkey. If you kill too much chicken, then you will create a systematic uh, crisis. But then if you only pick up one or two chicken and then monkey will not be frightened. <laughs> so that's the problem. We have to strike a balance between this uh, two uh, more radical and the more conservative approach. Okay. Yes, Ken. Now it's uh, worth keeping in mind that the anti-corruption campaign has been targeted. Uh, a very substantial percentage of officials at every level of this system, given the way the system has functioned, have had to engage in corrupt activity. Right? Some have become kleptomaniacs. Many are very good you know, professional people, but the system requires going beyond you know, strict boundaries. And uh, the, therefore, who you target and the sequence, sectors, sequence, localities, and so forth, is a matter in part of choice. And I think we've seen that uh, in part, you know, when you say the energy sector, well, Zhou mm. Yongkang had a good mm. part of his career in the energy sector. And mm. son of a gun, you know, the firm that he was most associated with in the energy sector got clobbered first. Huh? And uh, so some of this has been consolidating power uh, against the networks of folks that really you had good reason to be very concerned about uh, at the top of the system. Uh, some provinces have barely been touched. Others have really been focused on very hard. Uh, I think whoever mentioned it was correct when, when you said that they have affirmed that this is not going to stop anytime soon. So the past is uh, just a prelude to what's yet to come. So we don't know what the eventual scope will be. Uh, but. Uh, it is not simply a matter of anywhere you find corruption, you go after it. Uh, there's, a, there's a strategy behind this. And the question in part is whether the strategy will develop a dynamic of its own and it begins to spill out in ways that become uh, difficult to, to control. 
were you going to say something to that? Or because or, I was going to ask, and, and is this strategy in context of what we're talking about, the economic reform and the economic transition, is it is it a means to an end, in your view, to that end, or has it got its own well, look, uh, uh, rationale? Well, corruption had become predatory. It had reached a scale where they really, and had social repercussions and, and political repercussions that, you know, that they became very worried about. Uh, so I absolutely think it, it was important to attack the issue. Uh, whether they will end up having done that in an effective fashion, or whether they will end up having uh, created disincentives for, for experimentation and for reform, uh, and also created, let's keep in mind, the corruption effort to date, regardless of the fourth plenum decision on strengthening the judiciary and making it less subject to interference from local level party leaders and that kind of thing. At the end of the day, every, every one of the major corruption cases has been uh, intra-party in terms of the, the preliminary investigations that identify who to go after, in terms of the investigations of the people who become targets, in terms of the determination of guilt, uh, in terms of punishment of them and those with them. Uh, they now say that something like, as I recall, 40 some odd percent of those who have received, who have been found to have violated the party rules sufficiently to warrant substantial punishment, something like 40 percent have been kicked out of the party and turned over to the courts. The rest are handled totally within the party. The courts get them only after, for some of them, there are violations of particular state laws. Uh, that can be clearly identified, and for one reason or another, they turn them over for judicial uh, punishment. So this is a political process. It's not a legal process. It's a political process. And it's within the party targeting uh, a small percentage of those who are potentially uh, guilty uh, and handling the degree of punishment in an internal party process. I'm not sure that's a good way to promote reform over the long term uh, and to institutionalize new norms and rules in a way that will be consistently followed. Okay, um, I wanna let the audience come in, but I, I feel I need to ask one question about the US perspective on this and Ken having been in the White House uh, working on, uh, on China policy uh, for previous administration. Uh, you don't have to endorse any of our <laughs> recommendations. I'd be interested in what you think is the most important thing the U.S. could take away from this discussion, from this study, and, and, and what it should be doing about this, or is it none of our business? Well, no, it's not none of our business, certainly. And uh, I think the report, the report is really worth reading. I encourage people to sit down and really go through the it. The check is in the mail. The, uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, it, does it require my signature? Should I leave now to get the, the uh, uh, overall, as I think Matt noted in his public remarks, certainly is noted in the report, the directions of economic reform that the top leadership is seeking to, uh, to accomplish are in U.S. interest. They're broadly directions that we have encouraged for years. Uh, and so it's good to see that you know, these folks are thinking in those terms. Uh, a lot of your, uh, uh, I guess two points I would take away. One is that we do need better understanding in our, at a policy level in the United States of how the Chinese system functions. That there is still uh, too little understanding of the politics within the Chinese system. Uh, the policy process, the different levels of the system, and how that affects implementation. Uh, so the things that we just assume anyone would know about the United States, and that's why we aren't accomplishing this and are doing this, but many Chinese really don't understand it, is true in spades in the other direction too. And so it creates both misunderstanding and a misattribution of what is, what are the intentions and how uh, how effectively can you deal with people and who should you be talking to and how should you nurture that? I think your report moves that along, but your recommendation to get much more expertise at a policy level in the United States, I think is very valuable. But the second part of it is, uh, it's a huge problem to do that. When you add on the different 
staff positions that your report recommends and that kind of thing, you create bureaucratic conflicts in the U.S. that are very, very difficult to manage. And there are already a lot of those. So uh, I think the recommendations on the whole are very much worth thinking about for how you can make them work. But uh, uh, past efforts to do that in past administrations have sometimes been effective and sometimes just created more and more coordination problems and uh, bringing debates uh, into the NSC that, for example, that or between NSC and NEC that slow down policy making, lose the strategic perspective because you get into bureaucratic compromises and that kind of thing. You bring the agents, you bring the department's debates into the NSC at that granular level, it doesn't necessarily help policy making. So I think it's just, I mean, there are just real tensions in how do you bring greater attention and greater expertise to a policy level to have a strategic perspective where you can then follow a nuanced and consistent policy. It's just okay. very hard to do. All right, um, excellent. Again, food for thought, thank you. And thank you, uh, I didn't say at the beginning that everybody here contributed to this report and gave us a lot of helpful insight long before uh, this conversation, and, and we really appreciate that, you know, uh, Ken and, and others. Um, Okay, uh, but they don't own any of our recommendations or anything we said in here, by the way. It's clear this is our report, and uh, so we appreciate it. Okay, if you have a question, uh, raise your hand as someone in the back is doing. Uh, wait for the microphone. Please identify yourself and, um, and ask a question. If you want to direct it to anybody in particular, please say so. Otherwise, I'll choose them. Thank you very much for your great conversation. My name is Takahiro Mote. I'm a visiting fellow of CSS Japan chair. I'd like to ask you, uh, especially I want to ask Hu Fan Lao Shi Ho, Shirley San, one question. So Xi Jinping uh, just almost a year ago mentioned comprehensive security. So at the first meeting of Chinese NSC, and he, he mentioned 11 social, uh, sorry, comprehensive security, include economic and financial security. So I want to ask you is, what kind of role is Chinese NSC playing for making uh, economic policy, economic make, when Chinese government decide their policy decision, what kind of role is playing, uh, Chinese NSC is, is playing what kind of role? I, I'm sorry, my English is not good. So okay, do, does no, it thank make you. Sense? So I understood the, the um, we focused mostly on the other big new body that was set up at the third plenum, the Comprehensively Deepening Economic Reform Commission, but there was this National Security Commission set up as well, and it's a good question. Does it deal with any of these economic issues or is it only dealing with um, foreign policy or internal security for that matter? Well. I think the mainly it's internal and the foreign um, security, but uh, on uh, the uh, uh, diplomacies and probably they will also take economic issue into consideration. Yeah, I see. Okay. But I think it's asking uh, the uh, different role that the party and the government uh, play okay. in policy you want to address that? And uh, that I highly recommend that you read uh, Matthew's report because uh, 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 one, um, um, point uh, that he made in this report is that, uh, you know, for a lot of foreigners, you know, they look at the policy making in China, they will focus on government. But then uh, in this report, and they uh, um, emphasize the role played by the central party. And this is uh, um, even more relevant for this new leadership, because uh, we can see that uh, um, in the past, it's mainly the state council in charge of the macroeconomic policy. But now the central party, they also are uh, concerned about the macroeconomic policy and the, uh, um, the overall plan for structural reform. So that's an, uh, a, a dramatic new change for the uh, policy making in China. All right, good, okay, yes sir. Up, up here, guys, a few things. Thank you. Uh, I'm Tom Reckford with the Foreign Policy Discussion Group, and I wonder if Ken Lieberthal would like to go a little deeper into the fairness of the anti-corruption anti -corruption campaign. 
I recall lots of anti-corruption campaigns over the last 35 years, and generally they targeted uh, people that the leaders of the party wanted to bring down. Uh, Boji Lai uh, may have fitted into this category. Is this anti-corruption campaign different from all these others? Is it more fair, more honest, more balanced? It's reaching much farther. So I think that initially, you know, Bo Xi Lai, Zhou Yong Kai, et cetera, your description fits quite well. But I think that the sense, and I think those of us, I, I, all of us were in China before the uh, 18th Party Congress, where Xi Jinping, you know, uh, some of the top leadership posts. You know, I have heard complaints about corruption wherever I've been to China for many years, but the the vehemence of the complaints, the scorn with which comments were made, even among strangers, to how this place was falling apart because of corruption. The uh, comment at a conference I was at, people I didn't know, uh, and they didn't know me, the Chinese sitting at, at a table, and I was just at the table with them, talking about this, the current situation, like the Guomindang, uh, before the Second World War, the four big families, right? And I said, do you literally mean like the four big families in the global? <laughs> Absolutely, maybe worse, <laughs> right? Uh, so, and I think Xi Jinping understood this. So I think that there, and Wang Qishan certainly understood it, as uh, He Fang indicated, Wang Qishan knows all the tricks, uh, given his uh, career. And uh, I think there really is a determination to change behaviors here whether it is being pursued in a way that is fair, given the, uh, you know, the, the distribution of offending uh, folks, I, I don't think there's any way to judge. Uh, and I think there, there is certainly a risk that a lot of scores will be settled at lower levels, a lot of unjust things will occur. Uh, but uh, you know, at a popular level, I think this is very popular at this point. You know, a lot of people think those guys are finally getting theirs. You know? Uh, I am not aware, let me say, in past campaigns, one thing that has been particularly obnoxious is the use of quotas. You know, in this unit, you will find, you know, X number of rightists or Y number of this or that. In a strike hard campaign, you'll have X number of people convicted of this kind of crime within, you know, this period of time. I'm not aware that there are quotas here. I mean, that's, that really does foster very unjust uh, cases. Uh, but whether this is really fair, or whether it will end up on balance being fair is not a judgment. I, I think we have the metrics to even begin to make. Hi, Bing. Thank you. My name is Zhang Hai Bing. I'm a visiting scholar in the CSIS Freeman Chair. Firstly, congratulations, wonderful job for your you know, research. Uh, my first question to the panelist is uh, about, you know, uh, the title of this report is uh, Navigating Tropy Water. Tropy is means uncertainties. So my question is, from your perspective, what do you think about the most turbulent factor in the President Xi's decision making, typically in the economic sector? My second question goes to the Maso Goodman. As I know, you, your research group did a lot of research, uh, field study, interviews more than 100 person scholars, officials. So from your uh, perspective, what's your comments on the Shanghai Pilot Free Trade Zone? Do you think it's uh, still meaningful for China's whole economic reform if compared 30 years ago? Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, Hai Bing, and um, Hai Bing is one of those hundreds of people that we interviewed and was very helpful uh, to us. She's from uh, the Shanghai Institutes of International Studies, and I really appreciate all the support they've, they've given us throughout this project. First, I should explain the navigating um, metaphor because it's my own and I'm responsible for it. I thought of this um, challenge that China is facing as a ride down the Yangtze River, and for 30 years, China was on the kind of wide part of the river where it had all the advantages of, you know, in of cheap labor and um, high savings and markets to sell, you know, relatively low value added products into, 
uh, and one objective, growth. And all of that is gone, and they're now in the narrow part of the river. And the question we're asking is whether the guys on the back of the boat can manage this turbulent transition to uh, another wider part of the river with su sustained growth. So we call this the Navigator's Project. Um, I'll, I'll let others address the, the point about um, what they think is the biggest sort of uncertainty about Xi Jinping's um, style. But let me answer your Shanghai FTZ question, and then I'll come back. So we did uh, a couple of trips to, to Shanghai and um, happened to be there the day before, I think, the Shanghai FTZ was, was announced at the end of uh, 2000, or in the fall of 2013. And um, it uh, was explained to us at the time by various people as being driven by three basic motivations and um, not necessarily mutually exclusive, but, but depending on who you ask, they'd have a slightly different emphasis on it. One was Shanghai needed some new source of uh, dynamism and growth um, as a financial center and needed some, uh, something to sort of shake um, Shanghai's um, innovativeness and ability to compete, frankly, with other, um, other uh, financial centers in the region. Um, so that was one. It was a sort of a Shanghai bottom-up driven uh, initiative. Um, another was that the, that the center wanted to use this, uh, Beijing wanted to use this as a, you know, in a sort of Deng Xiaoping-like way of using the way he used Shenzhen uh, to, as, as an experiment, as a place to, to, to launch reform, uh, to, as a test bed for some national reforms. Um, and so it was really top-down, driven from Beijing. And the other was that, uh, that this was sort of an externally driven thing because of TPP and other developments going on in the, in the region and the world. Uh, China needed to have a competitive sort of response to that. And hence, you know, the negative list was developed in Shanghai as, as part of the, uh, and then introduced into the bilateral U.S. Uh, bilateral investment treaty negotiations. Um, again, uh, this is a little like, sorry, a Japanese reference, but the, the, like the movie Rashomon, where depending on who you were asking, they'd have a different emphasis on those three factors. But it seemed to be uh, based on those three things. Um, I have not been back there in, in, in almost a year, and so I've lost the thread a little bit. My sense is there's some disappointment with what has happened to the Shanghai FTZ, that it hasn't really fulfilled any of those um, objectives, at least yet. Um, uh, partly, I think this is because I think it was, there was a lack of ownership in terms of who really owned this thing and was, was, uh, wanted to drive it. And partly, I think, because what they're trying to do in a zone is, today is very different from what Deng Xiaoping was trying to do, where, you know, if you're producing, you know, cheap glasses from CVS, um, uh, you know, you can, you can create a zone and create incentives to, to, do, to do that. Um, uh, but, you know, with financial services, you, you, know, you can't put them in a box and experiment. It seems like you have to do all or nothing. And I think they've realized now that it's not a really good test bed for for broader reforms, at least in some of these services sectors that are more porous. Um, I, you know, I could say a lot more about the Shanghai FTC. We do talk about it. I think we at least have a sidebar in our report about it, and it's fed into a couple of the things we write about. Um, but if, if Scott or anybody else wants to add to that and then maybe take on the other question as well. Sure. Uh, well, I can speak to the, the choppy waters part of, of this. And obviously, the most important are, first of all, the problems. Uh, as Hufan mentioned, this trilemma. Um, massive debt uh, while you're trying to keep growth going, environmental problems, a whole variety of issues, uh, a very full plate for any leadership. And then you've got a political system that uh, essentially uh, ground to gridlock that wasn't able to deal with these things. And so what they've done is they've gone around that system by moving, by creating new leading groups and pushing policy making into the party, uh, and then the anti-corruption campaign. And so all of this feels like a big, broad campaign that you can't sustain forever. You can't forever just do this outside the standard bureaucracy. That needs to be reformed. And so that's, that's quite risky. Um, when I think about, uh, I've also used a boat analogy as, as well, um, and just as a little twist, uh, I think of Chinese policy making more like a sailboat. Uh, and when in choppy waters, how does a sailboat move ahead? They tack back and forth. And so you never feel like they're directly head on solving some problems. Sometimes it looks like they're making reforms, and other times it feels like they're, you're backtracking. 
uh, but you can't tell until you wait some time and then you look back and say, oh, I've actually moved some distance in addressing this. So in that regard, it's both, there's, there's other ways to think about that. Um, and given the challenges that they face uh, and the complexity of the political system, I think that back and forth tacking is something we're gonna see for quite some time. You wanna? I would just add two things. One, in terms of what worries me, I think one of the biggest challenges China faces is environmental. Uh, and it is, uh, you know, everyone talks about air pollution, it's especially water pollution, pollution of the soil. Uh, you know, it's huge. You know, the, it is growth constraining and potentially uh, much worse than that. Uh, I'm not aware of any high income country in the world uh, that has successfully dealt with environmental problems without permitting the development of a green political movement, of uh, environment, you know, non-governmental organizations that can organize and pursue political pressure. Uh, China has moved in the opposite direction on that. Uh, and so that worries me quite a bit. And then secondly, the stress on innovation, I think very rightly so, trying to go from extensive to intensive growth, but at the same time, uh, a strong political uh, atmosphere of uh, reducing uh, what you bring into the system from the West. Western values, uh, there are more protectionist measures in technology, uh, all kinds of things that, you know, I don't know where the balance has to be here, but uh, the, the contradiction between kind of this political thrust and the, the recognition of the importance of, of becoming much more innovative uh, is one that is I mean, it's going to be tested in a very serious way uh, in the next few years in China. Good. Couldn't have answered it better. Yes, sir. Over there. Uh, yeah, Bill Jones from Executive Intelligence Review. I'd like to comment on what Mrs. Chu said uh, about the, uh, the credit to GDP ratio. Uh, the numbers are very dramatic, of course, but it's really a question of where that credit goes to because if that credit is going into increasing the physical production, uh, that credit is solvent. Uh, if it's going to uh, paying off old debt or gambling casino or things like that, then of course you're, you're really in trouble. Uh, but we did that in the United States. Hamilton did the same thing and there was the same debate. Do we pay off the debt or do we keep it or do we increase it? He said, keep it, we'll increase it and we'll use it and we'll direct it towards building our economy. And I know that there are problems in China with, on the local level and elsewhere about the uh, uh, inflation and bad investment of that sort, but the recent moves by the party leadership around these new funds, the AIIB, the new uh, development bank, are all directed towards infrastructure, not to anything else, not to paying off old debt. And it seems to me that if that infrastructure is indeed uh, realized, then that's a very secure investment. And I think the fact that most of the world is running now to join the AIIB in spite of the very you know, arm twisting going on by the US indicates that they feel that that perhaps is a more solid investment than what they're getting in the London, New York system. And if you wanna look at debt to, uh, uh, debt to GDP ratios and you look at the, the debt in, in that system, uh, it's astronomical. So it really does represent kind of a new model, and to the extent that China is consistent in using this for that type of uh, increase of the physical economy, I think that the, the numbers are not important. What's important is where it's being directed. Maybe you want to comment on that. So Charlene, is there, in your view, a connection between you know, sort of the, the AIB and all that and, and, and dealing with some of these financial problems, and is it gonna actually help? Right. Um, I would say the issue, because we do, you know, I get this back a lot, where people say, well, 230% credit to GDP, what's the problem with that? We've got a lot of countries at that level, um, and that's absolutely true. The issue is not that we're at 230% of GDP, it's that we have increased 19 trillion US dollars in six years, and that is something that the world has never seen. And when you think about the credit to GDP ratio, you have to keep in mind that that credit is propping up the GDP number, right? So you're actually, yes, the two are going up and over time, it's not gonna look that out of balance, but it's because of that rapid growth of the numerator that you're getting the growth in the denominator. 
um, in terms of how much of this stuff has been going into um, you know, real investment that actually is gonna have returns. Um, you know, without a doubt, China's gotten growth out of this. It's not that we've, you know, had a ton of money that's just gone into um, people's pockets and, and, you know, things that haven't generated any growth. Um, but the problem is the returns are just not large enough to actually repay this stuff. Um, so we are going to have a significant amount of bad debt in the system. Um, infrastructure does generate growth. It is something that economies need, but there's a reason why in most countries around the world, infrastructure is funded by the public sector, not the private sector. And that's one of the big mistakes China has made in this whole thing is that they've undertaken this huge infrastructure push and they've leaned on the private sector to essentially do that. And there's this ambiguous um, question that all of us have in terms of are they actually gonna stand behind the banks and bail them out for doing what was really public sector type of uh, function. In terms of the AIB, um, you know, I think it helps on the margins to the extent that we're saying we have overcapacity in certain sectors in China and we, you know, we've got cement, we've got steel, we've got all this stuff that's way beyond what we need and can we direct that into other places where um, there's actually demand, and you know, I think that's certainly one way to do it. Um, the problem is we're talking about a 10 trillion US dollar economy that needs to grow at about seven or eight percent nominal every year, right? So this tiny little Asian investment bank is gonna, t it's gonna take a very long time for that to make any real difference in terms of uh, the economic picture in China. Okay, uh, Fan, I, I don't want to get too far off on the AIB because we'll do other programs. I'm sure this is going to be a long-running uh, movie. But, but just in terms of the connection to economic reform, to what extent do you think the AIB was motivated by a uh, need for you know, um, shifting some of the excess capacity and supporting you know, Chinese domestic growth and how much of it was not about that and about you know, geopolitics or other things? I think the AIB is still at a very early stage, so uh, I agree with uh, Chu that um, it um, may not have very significant impact on China's economic growth, but the most important thing for AIB is, um, you know, for China uh, in the past, uh, um, it always want to have um, a more say in the international uh, economic system, so we tried to reform on IMF and the World Bank but then even the tiny reform of the quota system in IMF cannot be uh, implemented. So China is trying another way, and they tried the BRICS Bank, now called the New Development Bank, and they tried other before the AIB, and there's a proposal of the <coughs> Northeast Asia Development Bank, uh, kind of uh, that. So um, I think for China, the most important thing for AIB is they feel more confident. They don't want to have the final say in the veto power in, in, in this new organization. But as long as China is one of the founding members of a new international institution, and they will feel that for any negotiation, for any discussion, they will be on the table. They know, they know what is happening. So that may get more confident for China to play a more positive role in the international community. So I think that's the good news for AIB. Okay. Um, yes, ma'am, in the back with the pink, red. Thank you. Uh, I'm Jennifer Lee with Hong Kong Phoenix TV. Uh, Follow-up question about the AIB as well for Dr. Liebethal and Dr. S um, Scotty. So, um, so far we have more than 45 countries decide to join the AIB, including the United States allies. Um, do you see that as a recognition of China's willingness to take on the global leadership, or is there other reasons that re intrigue those countries to join? What's your observation on all this AIB development, including their in interaction with the United States? And at the same time, the President Xi also uh, proposing to do the One Belt, One Road, which will help to build the infrastructure, uh, infrastructure across the Asia, Europe, and even Africa. Um, do you, from the United States perspective, do you think it's more like a threat or actually can become a source of the stability? Thank you. 
Okay, well, as I say, these are big topics and ones that we're gonna explore in, in other forms, but I'll allow, because it's an interesting topic to me and uh, relevant also here, a quick answer if anybody wants to take on either sure. halves of that. Sure. Uh, um, uh, the AIB is meant to be a development bank, and if you look around Asia, there's a huge uh, need for development assistance and infrastructure development, uh, seven to eight billion by some counts, or trillion, excuse me. Um, so uh, I think the Chinese decided that rather than trying to reform the World Bank or the Asian Development Bank, which they, their voice is relatively small in those institutions, uh, to create a different bank um, and where they get both reputational benefits and practice of leading an international institution, whether, regardless of whether they have the veto or not, but, but having a, a larger role. And this is a clear com uh, component of Xi Jinping's more active uh, international foreign policy that he originally outlined last November in the Foreign Policy Work Conference uh, in, in China. So we're, you're going to see, this is not the last Chinese initiative, you're going to see lots of Chinese initiatives. Uh, globally speaking, this is not the most important area of, of global governance. It's relatively safe compared to other areas they could, they could operate in. Um, and I think you saw other countries join uh, because um, there's no real downside to them not joining. Uh, there's a potential upside, it uh, uh, improves their relationship with China, since it's a very high priority for Xi Jinping and the, and the leadership, and may provide some type of benefits to their countries, uh, since they're mostly in Asia. So, uh, uh, and I think most of those countries did not see this as a, as a, choose, as a necessary choice between a Chinese-dominated system or an American-led system but participating in both, and I think that's the way the Chinese saw AIB as well. That wasn't how it was interpreted here in the United States. Uh, just one comment on the, on the Silk Road. Uh, that is a huge potential uh, growth area and also a high priority for, for Xi Jinping that links domestic, the domestic economy globally. Um, and the po policies that were outlined a, a few days ago at the Boao Forum that were released at the same time, um, long on goals, short on specifics. Uh, so actually, I'm a, I'm a little bit worried that without doing the due diligence and uh, feasibility studies, this is going to be eventually uh, a lot of investment uh, that will uh, not work out, the type of investment that Charlene and others have analyzed in China not working out. So they really will need to do their homework. OK, thank you. Uh, just one quick gloss on the AIIB. It is clearly the gift that we'll keep on giving to Washington think tanks that want to uh, <laughs> hold the program. Uh, I don't want to comment on the U.S. side. I, what, I, I would associate myself with what Matt said earlier about that. But uh, for China, I think that the, there's been a little bit, my guess is the Chinese have been a little bit surprised at the array of countries that have now signed up. Uh, and it's kicking this up into a new level. It may be a little bit of uh, watch what you wish for, uh, because uh, the Chinese are now going to have a lot of, of demands with a lot of people watching as to what the governing standards are, what the uh, standards of, of uh, you know, for making loans are, how effectively you can establish a solid credit rating. Uh, how that uh, enables or get or creates frictions with the ADB, with the World Bank and others. Uh, this is a new game. And they may end up learning a great deal and really moving up the ladder a great deal, which frankly would be good for everyone as far as I'm concerned. Or this may create problems in governance and eventually in reputation that they really will, uh, uh, will not see as a complete win by quite a bit. We'll have to see how it plays out. Okay, thanks. I, I will, if there are two more hands, yes ma'am, and then, and then uh, yes ma'am. Okay, and the gentleman in the back, really quick, but very quick questions please, because we're running out of time. I'm Jiang Yujuan with Xinhua News Agency, and my question is about uh, foreign direct investment in China. And some foreigner, foreign companies are closing their factory in China, and some foreign companies are complaining rising difficulty in doing business in China, such as uh, lower profit margin and uh, um, unclear regulation. And uh, so how the panelists evaluate China's current uh, um, business in climate 
and uh, do the, uh, will these challenges affect the overall FDI to China? And for companies, they returning their business in China, so why they make such choices? Thank you. Okay, thanks. Uh, so we keep note of these folks, and then. Um, Thank you, um, speakers. This is Paula Stern, the Stern Group, uh, and I think it was Ken who used the term innovation economy or innovation. And um, I know there's been major focus and it's a wonderful discussion on kind of today and decision making in China today. But I am wondering um, if uh, in your navigating choppy, choppy waters um, or this morning you might comment on China's pre pre preparatory basis for being a leader in innovation. Uh, there's always this comparison between how much DARPA gets funded versus how much the government in China is funding uh, basic research and really fundamental uh, uh, processes that uh, are the basis for innovation in an innovation economy. Uh, did you go into that at all? Um, would you? if not in the paper, comment on it today. Okay, thanks, and then one more gentleman in the back. Thank you very much. My name is Jim Chen, independent reporter. I had a quick look at your summary. Um, a recommendation to our point in two part. One is engage with China, the other is organizing US government. Then I have a quick telephone conversation with a US um, China watcher, and it, hey, pause a moment, I, I read the to our point and eight for China and nine for China and, um, and three point for the US government. And he had a pause of a moment and he said, okay, in short, he said, organizing US government to support China. That's what the US have been doing in the last 40 years and you supported rising China now at this point that it divide your allies and conquer them. What's your response? Thank you. Okay. Um, um, Scott, do you want to take on the first question? <laughs> no, not that question. Okay. We'll, um, we'll, we'll think about sure. that one. Let um, that one settle in. Yeah, so, so the first uh, one of it. Yeah, the, the first from our reporter from Xinhua. So um, foreign businesses, particularly American companies, uh, originally went to China because it, uh, as an export platform to elsewhere, as part of their global production chain to export elsewhere. Uh, and those are the types of companies that are most sensitive to rising costs in China, uh, labor costs, who w would potentially consider moving elsewhere. Uh, but most American companies who invest in China are in China for the China market. They want to get, uh, for, for a variety of reasons, they need to be in China because they need to be close to their customers, because transportation costs are high, because there are big barriers, protectionist barriers, or other types of things that make it make sense to be there to sell into China. And they are less likely to look at moving to other places uh, because China is where they want to be because of that market. Uh, the uh, American Chamber of Commerce in China uh, released a report uh, in February uh, uh, in which they had polled their members, uh, and about 15% of their members said that they were considering uh, potentially moving some of their production facilities in China elsewhere uh, because of rising labor costs. Now, they're all, that, they only asked about rising labor costs. You have a whole variety of other things, uh, a, a general feeling of less welcome, well, uh, foreign companies feeling less welcome uh, that was demonstrated in that survey. So there may be other reasons why they'd want to potentially move, uh, but given the size of the China market, the importance of, of these firms, the likelihood of, of massively abandoning China for uh, producing elsewhere is very unlikely unless uh, some of the problems we talked about here come to fruition in terms of financial crisis or other types of political dilemmas that companies would face that would then force their hand to think about the plan B, which they never wanted to implement. Okay, very quickly, the two of you want to comment on the FDI and innovation. Uh, and yeah, on, on FDI briefly, if you look at the U.S., you have to differentiate, of course, stock and flow. Uh, the stock of U.S. direct investment in China is decreasing. Uh, the flow uh, remains substantial. Uh, but the firms are facing, you know, slower economic growth, rising labor costs, and that kind of thing. So uh, the big attraction is to sell into China now or to participate in that market. I think the big thing about it, and the atmosphere is more difficult. 
Uh, I think the big thing that's going to shape the future is going to be, in addition to the bilateral investment treaty, whether China really opens up high value added services uh, to foreign direct uh, participation. If so, that is a huge opening in areas uh, where the U.S. does best. Uh, if that remains very constrained, uh, then I think that you know, foreign direct, U.S. direct investment in China is not going to, not going to be a shining part of our relationship. Okay. Um, I don't think that China can be the leader uh, for innovation on all the areas, but I'm quite confident in many areas China can do very successfully. Uh, one um, um, advantage of China is the market potential. So take uh, the, the high-speed railway. The uh, original technology was developed by Germany and Japan, but finally the market is in China. And by the same token, I'm quite confident uh, in the future, the most cut on the edge technology on dealing with air pollution will be in China, because you don't have market here. Um, and second advantage China has is um, we have a, a huge army of, um, 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 of um, uh, enterprise engineer. It takes us uh, almost 20 years to reduce the salary level of engineer uh, below that of the nanny. So uh, we have uh, a huge army of uh, well-trained, hard-working, and uh, um, enterprised engineer. If we can combine this uh, human resources with the market potential, and in many areas, China can then quite successfully. Okay, um, great. Uh, just, I, I'm not sure I understood the thrust of the gentleman's question back there, but let me say to the extent I understood it, I, I think what I would say is that um, the U.S. strategy since Nixon and crossing eight administrations now has been basically consistent, which is to pull China more deeply into the global rules-based order. And I think that's the, that was the right strategy, and it's been a hugely successful strategy for China and for the United States. And I would expect that that would be the basic uh, thrust of the uh, continued strategy in future administrations. And uh, the U.S. has an interest in a uh, strong, stable, uh, successful China. Um, and uh, we have lots to work on together, and we have obviously co competition we have to manage, but, uh, but that's always going to be a part of the relationship, and, and that's what our uh, recommendations were aimed at, whether they were under one category or the other. Um, so let me uh, end here because we're already a little over time, and we're going to have to cut into the, uh, to the um, uh, break. But uh, first, let me thank the panelists for joining me up here for a great discussion. Thank you all. And as I said, please uh, do go online. You can find the whole PDF of our report there. The, the hard copy report will also be ready in a, in a week or two uh, if you'd like that version. Uh, meanwhile, uh, there's coffee on the Sam Nunn Terrace, but we really need you back here by 11.29 and a half because we have to start at 11.30. Okay, thank you so much.